we had an interesting day yesterday because the school's network was down, not the internet, but the network, which means that for me to uh, access the notes to give them to fifth period, I couldn't use this computer. I had to use a little computer that's over on the side here and actually point the camera at it and connect the two to each other. And it worked out pretty well. In fact, it worked out so well that I thought, huh, that's probably how we're gonna do things when we come back together in class is that those of you who stay at home will still be taking notes like this. It's just that that computer there, which is what I usually run the notes up to the, to the LCD projector, um, that I'll just point the camera right at that and then have to figure out some way to make sure that you can hear me. So I'm working out those bugs. I might even try to start working out some of those bugs here right after class um, so that I can order whatever I need to order and beat the, um, the internet Amazon rush of teachers trying to get stuff. Because I imagine there's lots of schools that are going back the same time as us. All right, number one. Question number one says, a gas occupies 2.5 liters when it's at a pressure of 100, and kil 100 kilopascals. Notice how I wanted to say 101.3 kilopascals. That's just what rolls off the tongue because that's the, the common standard number for pressure in kilopascals. If the pressure changes to 40 kilopascals, what is the new volume? All right, so... Um, how do we think about how this problem works here? Let's put a pressure gauge on the side of this container here. And we already talked about how a pressure gauge works. It's basically a mechanism that as these particles inside of here collide with it, they cause the needle to spike. So the more often they collide or the harder they collide, the more they're gonna make the needle spike. Well, in this problem, we're not going to make them hit harder because we're not doing anything with temperature. In this problem, what we're going to do is we're just going to talk about how often they hit the gauge. When the volume is only this size, 2.5 liters, they hit the gauge this often, and they cause the needle to read 100 kilopascals originally. So what we need to consider is how could you make it so that the needle, we'll make it now in pink, will change from 100 down to just reading 40. Sounds to me like the way we make that happen is we need the molecules to hit the gauge less often, okay? Then the gauge won't read as much. So in order to make them hit less often, what if we gave them more room to roam? In other words, if we took this piston and we moved it outward so that now the beaker, let's say that the beaker now looks like this. Now, why am I drawing this right on the same picture? Let's make it its own new fresh picture. If the beaker now look like this with the, uh, piston out here, those same six particles that we have in that picture, they're now going to become pink. They now have this much room between them. So how often will they hit this pressure gauge on the side is not going to be as often because there's more places that they can hit by probability. It's really a math problem that here, this is a, a probability statement, but we don't treat it that way. We just treat it as a math uh, uh, operation that we have to do. We set up an equation. The equation that relates volume and pressure is V times P equals V times P. And then uh, whatever you choose as your ones and twos doesn't matter as long as the numbers that go together stay together. So 2.5 goes with 100. We put those on this side. You don't even need to put the units. Leave the units out. Uh, final answer, I'm going to put my units back in because that's what the AP test requires. But as far as the solving goes, they don't require that. So why would I let them get in my way? So if I want to get V2 by itself, I'm dividing 40 to the other side. Mathematically, they just canceled each other out. Units just canceled out too. Uh, 100 kilopascals and 40 kilopascals cancels out the kilopascals. That's why the units work. But like I said, they get in the way of the algebra. So it's easier if we just put them in um, at the very end. Absolutely, Manav, that's the way I do it too. I use the gas laws, the combined and, and ideal gas law instead of memorizing all three of these. Absolutely, for sure. In fact, when we get to Tuesday next week, that's exactly how I'm gonna present it to you. So right now we're just practicing in simplistic form. And then next week we're together, uh, we'll put it all together and then we'll talk about how we can make one law where it can solve every single problem. 
solve for V2. And you get an answer of 6.5. And notice that I included the units. I'm not going to grade you on units in honors chemistry, but next year in AP chemistry, you get graded for them. Uh, right now, we're reviewing for the AP test in AP chemistry. And so I've been making videos uh, of the released FRQ questions. So I sit down and I solve them. And then I uh, go and look at the, the uh, scoring summary online. And I look at it in the video with the students. Um, you know, I'm assuming that once they watch the video, we're still like we're together. And uh, today I did one. And the answer for something, we were solving for something called the rate law constant. And the answer came out to be 0 0.06. And the units of that are seconds to the negative one power. And that sound weird. That's what I wrote down. And on the AP scoring guidelines, I wasn't paying attention. The answer was actually hours to the negative one power. And you know what's crazy is even though I did everything right with the math, I put the wrong units, I get a zero out of one on that question. That hurt my feelings. It's like, come on, that's rude. Fortunately, this year, we don't have that happen to us. We don't get graded for the units, but you should practice putting them in now because then next year it just becomes common practice. It's common practice for me too. What hurt my feelings is the fact that I didn't pay attention. I didn't look at the data table that was given, was giving times, but they weren't giving the times in seconds. They were giving the times in hours. And I just thought they were seconds. So I made a mistake. So it happens. Practice using your units. Question number two, a gas occupies that same 2.5 liters when at 100 kilopascals, but this time we want the pressure to go up to 250 kilopascals. So in other words, if we're not changing how hard they hit, because we're not raising the temperature or lowering the temperature, how could we make the pressure go up? Well, how about if we don't give them as much room so that they collide with the, with the, with the pressure gauge more often, if you don't give them space? You guys understand this. Picture this as being the pressure gauge on the side of a bicycle pump and you push down, this is part of the handle, right? This is the part that you push down on. And then maybe over here, there's a valve that goes into the tire that you're filling up, all right? So what happens when you push down? We know that this pressure gauge goes up. It has no choice because the bicycle tire can't get any bigger. It's a fixed volume, it's a fixed size. And so the, the only thing that can happen then is that the gas particles with less space to move around have to exert bigger pressure on everybody, right? So when you're answering these questions on your test, please, 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 did I say please? Look at your final answer when you get your final answer and see if it makes sense. Does it make sense here? So let's plug this in and see if it makes sense. 2.5 times 100 equals V2 times 250. So to solve for V2, we divide both sides by 250, cancels them out on this side. It gives us that V2 comes out to be a number of liters. And then we do this math. And when we do the math, we look at our answer that we get that says one liter. And then we say, okay, if the original volume was 2.5 liters, does it make sense to me that the volume got smaller because the pressure got bigger? Yes. This equation right here is called an inverse relationship, meaning that when one goes up, the other has to go down to keep them equal on both sides. That's an inverse relationship. Unlike number three, which is now going to be a direct relationship. But before I go to number three, does anybody have a question on one or two? Yes, significant digits are uh, graded. So right now, significant digits in question number two are correct. Que significant digits on question number one are wrong because 100 kilopascals only has one significant digit. My answer should have only had one. Uh, that's where I did this. That's how I got the 6.5. So I set up the equation, divided 250 other side. This is why I ask you when you turn in your homework to me to show your work, because if you don't show your work, then I don't know where you make mistakes and I don't know how to fix them. Right? When you just ask me a question in the chat, I don't necessarily know what you mean by the question because it's just a line without seeing anything. So show your work and your homework. And let me go back to number one to show you how I got the one, uh, the 6.5. Oh, I got these backward, didn't I? That wasn't 6.5 down here. This one was one. It was right there. This is the one that came out to be 6.5, dividing 40 the other side. 
you multiply 2.5 times 100 and then you divide by 40. So you are one. Okay. Now, there is the possibility, since we're having so much fun right now, there is the possibility that somebody does question number two and gets the answer. Give me a second. 6.25. Okay. Let's say that on your test, you get the answer 6.25. I don't want you just to turn your test into me. I want you to look at your answers and go, which one of these answers do, does it appear to be correct? Because one of them is correct and one of them isn't, right? That's analyzing your answer. And so with this being an inverse relationship, if the pressure goes up, the volume must have gone down. So the one liter is the correct one, the 6.5 is not. How did I get 6.25? What I did is I just switched it up and said 2.5 times 250 equals V2 times 100, because it would be possible to put these in backward, wouldn't it? And then when you do this, you get 6.25. But that implies that the volume went, I'm sorry, that the pressure went down. So therefore, then the volume went up. Okay, inverse relationship. Okay. Question number three. All right, now we're talking about temperature. We have a gas that occupies 6.8 liters when at 327, and then we want to cool it down. We're going to put it into the refrigerator. Now, some of you might say, hey, this sounds like the experiment on the, the first experiment on the lab, or what you're going to do. Now, I, I wrote the lab based on what I found online, but when I do this demonstration in class, I do it differently than what it says online. They want you to take an empty Coke can, and some kind of aluminum can. And when you put that aluminum can in here, what they want you to do is actually put just a little bit of water inside the aluminum can so that that water starts to boil. Then you're gonna quickly take this out of the hot water, which will be at like, instead of 327, well, it's in Celsius here, it'll only be at about 100 degrees Celsius, but then you quickly transfer it to cold water and then the can crushes. I've already had some people complain that it hasn't worked. Um, how to make it work is the way I do it in class. Instead of putting the can in the water upright, I put the empty can in the water upside down. And instead of having the water inside boil, I let it collect the boiling water, you know, the water vapor as it boils out, it will boil into the can. Once it goes into the can, then you just quickly take that can and stick it into cold water while it's still upside down. And then it will immediately crush. Why? because exactly what just happened in question number, well, I mean, there's still pressure that has to be considered too, because the reason why it crushed was because the outside atmospheric pressure is greater than the inside pressure once it cools down. This question doesn't address pressure. It just talks about what the volume should crush down to be, uh, assuming, because this is assuming that the outside pressure stays constant, right? When at this particular temperature, the pressure of the atmosphere is pushing down on this uh, piston, but the gas themselves, they're pushing up on the piston with an equal and opposite pressure. Until you lower their temperature, then they don't push as hard. And if they can't push as hard, the atmosphere wins and causes the piston to move down. Okay, now all that big concept that I just explained to you, you can get away with not doing that and solving this question because what you're gonna do is find the relationship between volume and temperature, which is called Charles law. It says that V1 times T1 equals V2 times T2. And then you're gonna put in the numbers, 6.8 liters divided by the temperature. Now you can't use Celsius, you have to switch it to Kelvin. The reason for that is because uh, Kelvin temperature relates to the actual motion of the particles directly. Right, whereas Celsius temperature is just a measurement based on a thermometer. Um, the other easy answer is when we get to problems that deal with standard temperature of zero, we end up with a zero in the denominator, which is a no no. I'll show that when it comes up. There's Charles Law in action. Now, you know what's nice about these problems, and I'm going to do this to you on purpose. I'm going to give you numbers like this that require a calculator if you put them in wrong, but if you change them to sell, uh, to Kelvin, then all of a sudden it becomes really easy. If 600 reduces in half, 
6.8 is going to reduce in half. Okay. Now let's pretend that I think that I've written a question like that, but I screw up and the numbers aren't easy to see that this is happening. How do you solve this mathematically? This is called a proportion. And what we learn in math class about proportions is you cross multiply. When you cross multiply, it becomes uh, 600 times V2 equals 6.8 times 300. Now we divide. So we just cross multiplied. Now we divide. And then you get your V2 equals uh, 3.4. Okay. So when you see a proportion, a fraction equals a fraction is called a proportion. You cross multiply and divide. Or you get one of those fancy TI Inspire calculators from the uh, library and you type it in as you see it and you push solve and it does it for you. Question number four. A gas occupies 6.8 liters when at 327 degrees Celsius. The temperature rises to 427 degrees Celsius. What is the new volume? Okay, this one I do need to use a calculator for because if we use the same equation, V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2, and we plug in 6.8 liters over 600. I'm not, I'm putting the units in, I didn't need to, divided by 700. I can't see the relationship there. To just go up by 100 doesn't mean this goes up by 100. It's multiplication. So we have to actually cross multiply and divide. And when I cross multiply and divide, I end up with 7.9. All right, now let's stop for a moment and let's look at our answers and see if we like what we see. If you cool a gas down, do we expect the volume of the gas to get smaller from 6.8 to 3.4? Absolutely. So the piston has to move downward and make the volume smaller. In question number four, if we heat up a gas, do we expect the gas to expand? Absolutely. 6.8 expanded to 7.9. The piston has to move outward in order to make a bigger area inside the beaker. Okay. Um, I'm supposed to demonstrate a lab today, but yesterday I got so discombobulated with what was happening with the network that I never got the supplies out. So part of our assignment tonight is going to require us to wait until Tuesday after break to go over the last two problems. I'll do that then. Um, but the reason I'm bringing that up is because that demonstrates these two questions right here is we use them to see if we can figure out what absolute zero is. It's a great lab. Um, I'm going to talk about it today, though, because I have it in these slides. Uh, yesterday, I didn't have it in the slides that are on that computer because that one's old. It's got old stuff that's not as good as our uh, distance learning stuff. Um, but what you can do, and I may have put this into the lab uh, too, is take a water balloon and instead of filling it up with water, fill it up with air. Blow it up to about the size of a baseball. Then go to the stove and you have boiling. Okay, then put a string around it so that you can see what its circumference is. You don't even need to change the circumference to a volume. If you just leave it as circumference, that's fine for this lab because this is not supposed to be a measurements lab. It's supposed to be a concept lab. Put a string around it, get its, uh, get its waist size, right? Then take that balloon and go and stick it over a pot of boiling water. Put it over it for just a few seconds, eh, half a minute. And you, know, you might want to hold it by the little uh, end that you blow it up with and then take it out of there and quickly wrap the string around it and see how much the circumference has increased by. Then take that balloon and go stick it in the freezer. And then after about a half an hour, go and take the string and wrap it around it again and see how much that volume has decreased by. And you've just proved questions three and four, right? What a perfect lab, perfect lab for at home. We'll do it in class using glassware because we can get more accuracy with the glassware. Question number five, a gas occupies a fixed volume. In other words, you have a container and that container is closed off. There's no way for air to get in or out and there's no way for the container itself to change its size. It's at a pressure of 6.58 kilopascals at a temperature of 540 Kelvin and we're gonna cool it down. So the particles that are inside of here, let's put three particles inside of here they're originally moving really fast and they're colliding with the walls of this container super, super hard, okay? But then you cool them down. 
So now when you take this container in the second picture and these particles are still moving around, now they're moving at less than half their kinetic energy. What's going to happen inside to the pressure in there? It's going to go down. So I expect an answer less than six. How much less? We'll let our calculators tell us. P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2. Um, 6.58 kilopascals over 540 equals P2 over 210. Cross multiply and divide. Do you need a reminder on how to do that? Multiply those two, multiply those two. You end up with 540 times P equals 6.58 times 210. Then divide both sides by 540. And you got your P2. I expect a smaller answer. 2.56 is smaller than 6.58. I'm happy. Why do aerosol cans say do not incinerate? This is not a good answer. They blow up. What are we, social media? That's not how you answer a chemistry question. You answer a chemistry question, why don't you uh, incinerate an aerosol can? You say an aerosol can is a fixed volume that contains some leftover particles inside. Those particles are at a fixed pressure. In fact, we could even say if we were chemistry teachers, probably at the pressure of the atmosphere, which is why they're no longer coming out of the can, right? When you're using a paint can, spray paint can, and it stops spraying, does that mean it's empty? No way. There's still a ton of paint in there. The problem is, and there's, and what propels it is also still in there. But the problem is, is what propels it is uh, now the same pressure as the outside. So this aerosol can, like a, like a spray paint can, is now at the same pressure as the atmospheric pressure. Okay, it's a fixed volume. Its pressure is at 101.3 kPa, and it's at a temperature of standard atmospheric room temperature is around 20 degrees Celsius, which we could call that 293 Kelvin, sorry, 10 mole, right. Okay, so what happens when you incinerate it? That means you make the temperature go up really high. Well, the volume is fixed. So the only thing that can happen in order for this temperature to go up really high is the pressure has to respond by going up really high. Now, if that pressure is greater than the strength of the can, the can is going to rip open. Like they said in yesterday's chat, is it's gonna shoot shrapnel all over the place. Well, odds are it won't. Odds are it's just gonna crack along a seam, but it's gonna shoot hot propellant and paint all over the place. And that could be dangerous. So. That is the way you answer a chemistry question, not just they blow up, okay? Not that I marked that wrong because I don't ever mark your homeworks wrong um, unless they feel like you didn't do anything. But just remember that if I ask you a question that's conceptual on the test, we want more than just what social media would respond. We want an answer that is explaining how chemistry works. All right, you guys threw a bunch of stuff in the chat here. Yes, same thing would happen with a soda, absolutely. Absolutely. It would be a little safer because at least what's inside is not um, like caustic, but still if it's hot, it's still going to maybe hurt somebody. But a can probably would break open if the soda is still in it, would probably break open even below boiling temperature because the carbon dioxide gas is going to start being released from the can just while it's going from room temperature up to uh, boiling temperature of water. And then that'll cause the can to crack open and then it just will start spraying out soda. So it'll be messy and you shouldn't do things like that. As much as that would be fun to do for a lab, uh, I'm not authorizing anything like that. You would have to show me in the start of your video where I see your parents face and they say, I am okaying this lab. And then that you guys show proper safety while you do it, which means like safety glasses and standing back. So if you're going to do something crazy like this, just remember that I'm going to treat this like they say at the beginning of ridiculousness. Any video submissions will not even be considered. Okay? I will only consider them if I see that safety and parental approval has been uh, are happening. Okay, But otherwise, that sounds like fun. Oh, now you're talking about putting it in the freezer. Um, 
Okay, so now with the freezer, you have the you you have something that's not based on the gas laws necessarily. Um, oh, oh, there's our assignment that we have today. We'll we'll start doing that. In fact, you know what? Let's just work straight from this slide here. While you're looking at question number seven, I'm going to answer what was just thrown to me in the chat about putting a soda can in the freezer. So you start number seven, which says a sealed container with a movable piston. There it is. Occupies a volume, a volume, when at a pressure. If the pressure increases, what do we think is going to happen to the volume of it? So we're looking at this conceptually. And if you want to do this with numbers, you can. I'll explain that in a moment. Okay, back to the soda can inside the freezer. Um, we got a couple things that are going to go on there as it gets colder. Um, technically, when liquids get colder, when water-based liquids get colder, they can actually hold more carbon dioxide. But what tends to happen is as the water starts to form ice crystals in there, it pushes the carbon dioxide out of the soda. Once it pushes the carbon dioxide out of the soda, remember that inside the can, it's mostly soda. So the amount of airspace that's right here at the top is very, very small. So you're filling that airspace with a whole lot of carbon dioxide, which will then cause it to crack open. The second thing that can happen is once it completely freezes over, because there's so little space inside of there, the ice, the soda ice, will take up more space than the volume of the container, and the ice will actually cause it to crack the same way if you put, you know, Water, just regular water into a glass container that was fixed and, and put it in the freezer, it too would crack. So you got a couple different things that could be going on with putting that in the freezer. All right. So the equation, for those of you who are analyzing this based on the equation, is this. This is called an inverse relationship. If one gets bigger, the other one has to get smaller so that they stay equal to each other, right? So the answer to the question is, if the pressure increases, the volume must decrease to make up for that. That's the simple answer. Now, um, what other things can we do to answer this question? What if you picked a volume? What if you said 10 liters? Notice I didn't pick one. The reason why I didn't pick the number one is because what happens if one gets smaller you have a decimal and I don't like decimals. I don't like fractions. I want to deal with whole numbers. So let's say that you have a volume of 10 liters and you have a pressure. I like to use standard atmospheric pressure, but I just round it to hundred because I don't want to get a calculator out. And we want to know what happens to the volume if you increase the pressure. Well, what's, what's an increase of pressure from hundred? You could pick 101 or 102, but then you're going to have to use a calculator. So why not pick another number that's an easier thing to analyze? 100 to 200 is still an increase, right? So when that doubles and you solve this equation, you don't need a calculator. You should recognize that the volume got cut in half because the pressure got doubled. Okay, so if the volume got cut in half, that tells us that the volume decreased. So there's our answer, decrease. I don't think I have answer slides here. Oh, I do. Let's do seven, eight, and nine in class. And we're supposed to do the experiment for 15 and, or for 16 and 17 in class, but I'm not prepared to do that today. So instead we're gonna do seven, eight, nine, and 10 in class, then leave you, I think actually we even did 11 yesterday. Then we'll leave you with the rest of them for homework, except for 16 and 17, you can't solve because there's probably not enough information. But we'll take a look at this on these newer notes and see what it says. But I definitely wanted to do that experiment. In fact, I was going to use that experiment as backup as a virtual lab for those people who don't do a at home version that don't want to take the time to do an at home version. You're stuck with a less fun virtual version. I don't want to do that, but I will do that on Tuesday. The lab's not due till Wednesday anyway. Question eight. Did I have an answer for number seven there? Nope, that moved right into 16. So we already did number seven on that last slide. So let's move into question number eight now. So please take a little bit of time here to look at it.
that should be about enough time for you to think that one through. Remember that there's no numbers required here. So you're really just giving me an answer and you do on a test question, you will get problems like this and you will have to explain your answer. It's gonna say, will it increase or decrease? Justify your response. So how you justify it is completely up to you and many justifications will get full credit. Okay, so here's what we know about this is what relates volume to temperature is called Charles law. And it says that V over T equals V over T. This is a direct relationship. If one goes up, the other one goes up in order to make them equal to each other. Okay, so you could say that. You could say something about the fact that if you heat the particles up, they're gonna have more energy. And if they have more energy, they're gonna need more space so that they don't exert more pressure. So they're gonna cause the volume to increase because the temperature increased. That's a harder answer, but that's a good one. And then the last thing you could do is you could actually show me by taking your same 10 liters from the previous problem. Divided by a temperature. I don't know what temperature you want to use. I'm going to try to keep things easy. I'm going to pick 100 Kelvin. And I want to know what's going to happen to the volume if the temperature increases. How about we pick 101, 102 Kelvin? No, why would you do that? Pick 200 Kelvin because then it's easy. You don't need to get a calculator out. If the temperature doubles, the volume has to double. So you could prove it to me mathematically if you're asked to answer a question like this and explain why you picked what you picked. Math is just fine. Question nine. A sealed container is then assuming that it's a fixed volume. So it should have said a sealed container contains a fixed volume. <sighs> well, we don't usually give a name to this equation here. A lot of times it's given credit to a French chemist named Guy Lussac. And therefore, uh, it could be Guy Lussac's law if you want to. But regardless, pressure and temperature are a direct relationship, just like volume and temperature were. In fact, all of these are direct relationships except boils. That's the only one that's an inverse relationship. Everybody else is a direct relationship. And you're like, well, what else is there? There's also moles, right? Our old friend, moles get to be in here too, but that's not till next week, Friday, or the first week back, Friday. So um, P over T equals P over T. So I don't know, pick a number. How about 100 kilopascals? That was our old friend from earlier. How about 100 Kelvin? That was our old friend from the last problem. And we want to have the temperature increase. So how about make it go up to 200 Kelvin? What do you think is going to happen to pressure? No calculator needed there. 100 over 100 equals 200 over 200. So what can you tell me about the pressure? It went up. So if it doubles, it doubles, but that means we don't need to go up by double. We could actually have done the 101 or 102. If it goes up to 101 degrees or 101 Kelvin, it's gonna go up to 101 kilopascals. Good time. Any questions on seven, eight or nine before I go to 10 and 11? Before I go to number 10, because what's on, oh man, number 10 is not even on this slide. Ah, oh, you guys are getting a break. You're just gonna have to do 10 through 15 on your own. And I think you can handle it. But let me at least talk about this because this is the lab that we're gonna do in class. I'll do it virtually. And then we do it as a class when we're together is you're gonna take a uh, Erlenmeyer flask. That's the flask that have this shape to them. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna fill it with water and then pour that water into a graduated cylinder so we can know exactly how much water does this Erlenmeyer flask contain, okay? So we fill it up and we find out that it's 244 milliliters. Now we make sure it's empty. With it empty, we know that it's full of 244 milliliters of air at room temperature. No, because we're gonna heat it. So you're gonna take this and you're gonna put it upside down into a beaker of boiling water. So here's our boiling water and you put this flask in upside down. 
okay? And what do we know about inside of here? Just like the aluminum can, it's gonna get as hot as the boiling water temperature is. So the boiling water temperature in Apple Valley, anywhere from 96 to about 98 and a half. It really all just depends on the thermometer because they're red alcohol, they're not very accurate. But I change that to Kelvin. So then on my Kelvin scale, uh, no, I don't. I'm gonna leave it in degrees Celsius for, for my graph. So what I have here is a volume of 244. So if this is where 200 is, see how these go up. So 150, 60, 70, 80, 90, 200, 210, 220, 230, 240. Oh my gosh, it barely makes it on the graph. And we put a dot at around 96, which would probably be right about there. So there's my first dot, okay? Then what we do is we take this flask out of the boiling water and we cover the bottom of it. Uh, it would be microscopic difference, exactly, exactly. Even compared to down the hill, it's still a pretty small difference. Just a degree or so is really all it would be, but you're right, just a little bit of difference. I mean, even if we compare Granite Hills High School to Apple Valley High School, they're not gonna be exactly the same boiling temperature, but they're gonna be super, super close probably within a hundredth of a degree Celsius. So it is small. All right, so then we take this flask. Now this is the hard part is you've got to take it out of this hot water and put your hand over the bottom of it so that it, and without burning yourself and keep your hand over the mouth of the Erlenmeyer flask and then stick it into a cold water tray. So we'll have a little like a, like a shoebox kind of tray that's made of plastic that's filled with water that's at uh, maybe 10 degrees Celsius. And now you stick that flask down inside of there. When you do that, what's gonna happen is the minute you take your hand away from it, water is gonna go squirting on up here because of the fact that the air inside of there, which is mostly just hot water vapor, cools down. And as it cools down, it doesn't take up as much, it doesn't wanna take up as much space, but the glass can't shrink. So the only thing that can happen is this starts filling up with water inside of here. I use a rubber stopper with a hole in it so that it squirts like a fountain inside of there. If you just leave it open, it just fills up with water. That's not very exciting. So now what's going to happen is at 10 degrees Celsius, it's going to fill up with water. And, you know, you can hear me pausing right now because I'm trying to cheat. I want to look at this graph and make sure that the answer comes out to what I want. It's going to fill up with water until the space of gas left over shrinks down to about... I wish I was better at math, uh, 160, okay? So this volume comes out to be about 160 milliliters of air. How do you measure that? By subtracting out how much water you collected. So all you gotta do is take this captured water, pour it in the graduated cylinder and see how much water you collected. Subtract that from 244, it should come out to be 160. So there's a dot at 10 degrees, comma, 160, which is right here. Then you take a good old fashioned ruler and you connect the dots. Ah, I missed. And that is your measurement for absolute zero. I got negative what? Like negative 170 would be my measurement for absolute zero. So if I was looking at this and I could have said to you that this number here was 170, that would have put the dot here instead then my graph would have gone and hit. Now it still didn't hit low enough, did it, right? So you can see that those two points uh, help line up to where would they take up no space at absolute zero. All right, I think I'm done talking to you. You're gonna finish up the rest of this homework assignment, which means like 10 through 15. But look at that, yeah, six problems for homework plus a fun lab. What a nice class. Aren't you glad you chose a, uh, honors chemistry instead of regular chemistry? I'll see you guys on the other side. I'm going to stop this uh, share, stop the record.